Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Red River Basin Cold Climate Agricultural Nutrients BMP pre-workshop webinar. Wow, what a mouthful that is. Um, I'm Rebecca Power, Director of the North Center, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. If you're not already registered for the workshop on April 16th and 17th, please do so. We uh, first and foremost need your expertise um, to help us understand uh, where, when, and how these um, best management practices are effective in cold climates. And we also need to have an accurate count uh, for the University of Minnesota Extension and the University who are hosting us for that workshop. Uh, so, and I'm going to uh, put in a, a URL uh, in the chat box um, so you have that available to register. Uh, so we'll have two presenters today. I'm going to introduce them in a minute. Um, this is the, our first webinar on Red River Basin geology soils and soil nutrient characteristics. We, uh, the, our two presenters will speak for approximately 20 minutes each, uh, so we should have a little bit less than 20 minutes or so available for questions. Uh, we'd like you to submit your questions in the chat box. Uh, that chat box is accessible uh, in through the purple collaborate panel, um, which is in the lower right hand corner of your webinar screen. So you just click on that that purple uh, chat balloon and you uh, should be able to access the chat box. Uh, there is a, a phone in option. I noticed a number of you option uh, and that can be accessed uh, but if you have audio issues and you were previously joining uh, via the web you can access that that uh, phone in option through the session menu which is in the upper left area of the webinar screen um, and there's a place to select use your phone for audio uh, we are recording this session and it will be available for folks that you know may not have been able to attend uh, so we'll, we'll have that up and available for you prior to the workshop. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, Scott Quorum uh, is our first presenter, senior environmental engineer with Bar Engineering, uh, and he's going to be talking about basin geology. And our second presenter is John Brecker. Uh, he's a senior scientist with AgVice Laboratories, and he is going to be talking about Red River Basin Soils and soil nutrient characteristics. So here's Scott. Uh, for those of you that do not know him, uh, I'm not going to read through his, his eminent qualifications. I'll just let you uh, skim those. Uh, so, and he's obviously been doing this for a number of years, and uh, we're really pleased that he's going to be giving us this information ahead of time so we can dive into the recommendations uh, when we get to the workshop. So, with that, uh, go ahead, Scott. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. So, I wanted to introduce also Megan Quinlan. She's our GIS specialist, and she's put together some neat maps that I'm looking forward to showing you folks uh, later in the presentation. I also want to acknowledge that uh, I have a client, North Dakota Soybean Council. I uh, work as a water quality specialist for them and they've partially sponsored my time uh, on this uh, for this workshop okay so a presentation outline a real brief background on the red river basin uh think seems appropriate since i'm the first presenter to give at least a little bit of a background and then we'll talk about some of the geological influences in the red river basin and that first major bullet point We'll talk about textures, so some of the physical properties of soils. And then that second major bullet point under glacial influences, we'll talk about bedrock and some of the chemical influences on soils and sediments in the Red River Basin. Okay, spoiler alert, I only have time to talk about nitrate. It'll be kind, it's more, a little more sensational than phosphate, but I do want to share that at North Dakota, at least, we have high enough calcium concentrations in our groundwater, when I'm talking maybe more than 10 milligrams per liter, not very high, frankly, uh, 
I mean, we have higher than that, but it doesn't take a lot of calcium. With a little bit of fluoride, say 0.2 milligrams per liter, and we have typically on that order less than a half a milligram per liter of fluoride, then you get a mineral called fluorapatite that's super saturated. And the tendency would be then for that to precipitate out of solution and out of the water column. However, that being said, that in areas with low concentrations of calcium and reducing conditions, such as you would find in areas of the Precambrian Shield, in Minnesota, or rocks that have been derived from the Precambrian Shield in Minnesota and maybe southeastern Manitoba, phosphate can indeed be soluble. And so that may be an issue for those of you on the east side of the Red River Valley. And we'll talk more about that igneous bedrock uh, geology that you have there. All right. Oh, no, it didn't show up. Not sure what happened there. But this was a slide. Boy, I hope this doesn't happen for all of them. Or we'll be in tough shape. This is a slide that was provided by Mulla and Golski about the administrative boundaries within the Red River Basin. Probably all of you have seen them. The, the quote I like is from the Red River Basin Commission, you know, three states, one province, two counties, one river basin, one Red River Basin. And of course that Red River drains into one lake, Lake Winnipeg, which is north of the city of Winnipeg. Ah, good, this one worked. <laughs> and of course we know that this is a cold climate on average, probably about the mean temperature would probably be somewhere in the order of four degrees centigrade. And with respect to land use, you know, just a quick glance at this map shows that agriculture, particularly cropland shown by the yellow color, it's the dominant land use in the basin. So I think the last three slides clearly indicate that it's indeed appropriate to have this cold climate agricultural nutrients BMP workshop for the Red River Basin. Now let's talk a little bit about geology. So again, we see the slide on the left and the, uh, the scale did not show up, but the idea is that green is low scale, uh, low slopes, yellow is intermediate, and red is a higher, uh, greater slopes. But I wanted to show this because the area in green represents, representing the low slopes, correlates well with the extent of glacial lake Agassiz at its highest extent. And you can see that with the cross hatched figure on the right. That represents the Lockhart phase, again, the, the highest extent of glacial lake Agassiz. So the glaciers came down the most recent glaciation and about 12 to 13,000 years ago, Lake Agassiz began to form at the toe of the glacier as it retreated. So it's known as a probe lake. And of course, as the glacier retreated, there are lots of sediments in the ice that were mobilized, uh, drift it's called. And so we have really two different types of glacial drift. We have till, which is simply the unsorted sediment deposited directly by the melting of the ice. And then we have stratified drift, which is a relatively well-sorted, maybe very well-sorted sediment uh, laid down by glacial meltwater. Now on the right, we see some of the glacier, some of the, sorry, some of the drift, major drift aquifers in North Dakota. And also up here, we have the Cinnaboyne Delta Aquifer. It's not really in the Red River Basin, but the Assiniboine Basin, but it is a major, the major drift, I should say deltaic aquifer or fan aquifer in the region. Over here, we have sandy lands, uh, again, formed by um, glacial fluvial deposits, subaqueous glacial fluvial deposits. And you see here, we have several deltaic or underflow fans on the fringe of Lake Agassiz. So as the glacier retreated, a lot of 
We had some new rivers and some of the existing rivers were full, laden with sediment. They emptied into Lake Agassiz and dropped their load. And these fine from the coarser sediments up here, for example, and they fine to the south, at least in that example. Uh, I do want to show quickly, I couldn't, we weren't able to get the shape files to work in, in Minnesota, but I want to do a quick slide here. Uh, this is unfortunate. We, the shape files, there, um, there are some lake deposit aquifers uh, in Minnesota along Glacial Lake Agassiz. Um, we weren't able to download these because it's, well, they're older shape files. And right now, Minnesota is doing county surveys and updating a lot of this information. But they're doing it based upon priority of population centers. And so only really one county in Minnesota is completed. But I do want to show you that we have here some of these lake deposits along the eastern shore in Minnesota. I just wasn't able to get those in the figure. All right, so we have, as I mentioned, we have some delta, deltaic aquifers along the shore of Lake Agassiz. We also have some sand plained aquifers, such as the Otter Tail region, which would be over in this area over here. And so as the glacier retreated, the, the sediments were just simply dumped onto a plain, and the coarser sediments uh, fell out of the water column first, and uh, they formed some areas, well, of course, for sediments. You see the soil permeability here. Um, again, this is the same scale. The green is low soil permeability. Yellow is medium. And high would be the higher permeabilities. Uh, we also had areas where the glaciers retreated, and there were some valleys. And those valleys filled up with coarse grain materials in many cases and form some buried valley aquifers. And that's what you would see uh, in this region coming up to the surface. And of course, there are some beach ridges. Probably these would be more beach ridges. They're surely not. These are thicker. These soil zones are thicker than the aquifers represented in that previous slide. So not all of these would go below the soil zone. So that suggests that some of these deposits less soils that are permeable, but are underlain by till, maybe only three feet or below the soil zone. All right, so those are some of the stratified drift aquifers that we have. OK. I should go back. Sorry about that. I wanted to point out two areas. Here we have the Cheyenne Delta Aquifer, which is the largest deltaic aquifer in North Dakota. And here we have the Otter Tail Outwash Plain, which is also another aquifer in Minnesota. And these two aquifers were studied uh, in a study well over 20 years ago now. And the purpose of choosing these two areas was particularly because we're very similar to one another. But they found that the water quality in these two aquifers were surprisingly different. And they said that it looks like farming had a much greater impact on the Otter Tail Aquifer than the Cheyenne Delta. And um, they were called surprising differences in the report. And so these differences were attributed to relatively minor variations, mostly physical variations. Um, of course, I argue it's just because North Dakota producers are better farmers than Minnesota producers. <laughs> no, of course not. I think there's something else going on here. Well, here's a more recent study, which suggests it probably has not very much to do with agricultural practices at all. And so if you read this conclusion, 
there does appear to be a correlation between fertilizer application rates and groundwater concentrations of nitrate in Minnesota counties, but little correlation in North Dakota counties. Well, that's interesting. Why is that? This is a masterpiece. This, she pieced this together of the bedrock geology for Manitoba, Minnesota, and North Dakota uh, in the Red River Basin. And these variations in color and shapes are not simply the result of different public, different government entities just using different characteristics. That's not the case at all. What's really, I think, very fascinating about this picture is that the Red River Basin is a really good boundary between the sedimentary rocks to the west in North Dakota that are represented by those long swaths of color and the igneous and metaphor metamorphic rocks associated and derived from the Precambrian Shield in Minnesota. And you can see, you know, some of these igneous intrusions down here, little bits here and there. And yeah, there's some, there's some shale here. There's some sedimentary, sedimentary rocks here and here. But the vast majority of Minnesota in the Red River Basin is underlain by igneous and metamorphic rocks. Igneous and metamorphic rocks have very different chemical characteristics than do shales and sediment and other, well, shales in particular. So let's go on. Why the big deal about shale? Well, these are Jurassic and Cretaceous rocks. We've cut out all the other rocks that uh, are from a different time period. And what I want to show here is these rocks are predominantly shales. There are some exceptions. Um, this unit here is the Inyan Cara formation. And so 250 miles to the west, this is the formation that's the sandstone that's receiving most of the produced water from the Williston Basin. It's about a mile deep in that area and it's sandy. All right. And then over here we have the, uh, this is the, uh, I'm drawing a blank all of a sudden. Well, this is the Hell Creek Formation. This this blue, this kind of blue purple, and the Hell Hell Creek Formation. This is exciting because if you've been watching and listening to the electronic news this week and the Bismarck Tribune this morning, in the southwest corner of North Dakota, the Hell Creek Formation crops out, and paleontologists have found what they believe is a fossilized snapshot of a mass death associated with the astero asteroid strike that ended the Cretaceous period. Okay, that being said, um, and this is the Fox Hills here, this brown, all these other formations are shales, all right? Well, who cares? <laughs> What's the big deal about shales? Well, the depositional environment for shales is intrinsically different than crystalline rocks associated with the Precambrian period. There's much more intrinsic link with life forms, and these life forms then buried lots of organic carbon when these shales were being formed in an offshore marine environment. These organic carbons, first of all, organic is important for organic contents of soil, for soil health, but then as they're reduced, we form sulfides. Sulfides could be organic sulfides as well as pyrite, FES2. And also we can form ferrous iron minerals uh, through that reduction process. So the important thing to note here is that shales typically, particularly dark shales, have high concentrations of organic carbon, high concentrations of pyrite, and high concentrations of other ferrous iron minerals. These minerals are, in some cases, very reactive with nitrate. They also influence pesticide mobility, but that's a little beyond the scope of our talk here. So again, let's go back to these slides. 
again, all right, so we have um, these shales, and assuming that the glacier is moving from the north, which is generally the case, and it ground up some of these shales in the aquifer, and then as the shales retreated, these drift aquifers were filled with fragments of shales that have a lot of electron donors. Okay, now given what we know, I'll give you another hint, they're, the only sand units are the Indian Car, the Fox Hills, and the Hell Creek. There are no unconfined aquifers of significance on the Indian Cara. So where would you expect to find nitrate concentrations that were the least affected by denitrification with some of these electron donors? Well, I think you would say probably in this region because there's no, there's no shale associated with this region. It tends to be more easterly. Well, recall that second publication I cited by the USGS. Sheridan County indeed had the highest median nitrate concentrations on the North Dakota side of the Red River Valley. Well, let's consider another aquifer, one of these underflow fans, the Elk Valley Aquifer. It's right in the middle of shale units, and all of these shale units have high concentrations of electron donors. So presumably, the Elk Valley Aquifer would have high concentrations of shale, and they do. If you look at the logs, they have high there are high concentrations of shale. We've done six in situ tracer tests at a single site in the Elk Valley Aquifer. In all cases, the nitrate that we added disappeared. It took some time, months, but we put over 100 milligrams per liter of nitrate nitrogen into, into, these, into this in situ site, and we watched the site, dis we watched the nitrate concentrations disappear over time. So we did six of them in about a 10 year period. Let's look a little bit more at the Elk Valley. Here's a, here's a picture of the Elk Valley Aquifer. Now I wanna point out here that if you try to do a vulnerability index on aquifers, the Elk Valley Aquifer from a physical vulnerability perspective is incredibly vulnerable to surface contamination. Here's why, there's little slope, so you have a lot of you don't have any runoff to speak of, it all infiltrates. These are sandy sediments. They're unconfined. There's, and, for, and also, the water table is less than three meters deep in general. So this, this site maxes out for physical vulnerability to surface contamination. Now we're focusing on nitrate. But look at this, look what happens when you consider the chemical side of things. There's enough pyrite in the sediments of the Elk Valley Aquifer to support autotrophic denitrification. That simply means denitrification with inorganic electron for 10,000 to 100,000 years, okay? You know what? To this day, I hate to say this, but our still state health department considers the Elk Valley Aquifer to be one of the most vulnerable aquifers to contamination in the state. And on some characteristics, particularly pesticides and nitrate and phosphorus, it simply is not true. Okay, so that doesn't mean I'm against best management practices, of course. We still need to have best management practices. But consider if you're a government agency or you represent a government agency and you have limited funds, and don't all government agencies have limited funds? We can first find the aquifers, like those in Sheridan County that are truly vulnerable to some of these agricultural contaminants, and apply the best management practices to them and put the Elk Valley on the back burner, maybe for a couple few years. But remember, if we're using up these electron donors like pyrite, it's being mined. And so these best management practices really need to be incorporated in the Elk Valley Aquifer as well.
Okay, well, let's go back to the Precambrian bedrock in Minnesota. We have done some studies in Minnesota. It is harder to find aquifers that have denitrification capacity, but there are some. And it really hasn't been investigative, thoroughly investigative studies. Let me give you an for instance. See this light blue area here, and we have some shale there. What if you had a glacier kink that came down and uh, ground up some of this? This is a schist here. This blue is a schist and deposited it into some drift aquifers nearby. Some schists have high concentrations of pyrite. In northern France, there's a schist aquifer that has a lot of pyrite and great denitrification potential. Is that true in Minnesota? I don't know. I don't think Minnesota has these super denitrifying aquifers like we have in North Dakota, but there may be some. And the same thing may be true for the Assiniboine up here, more likely than the sandy lands here. So in summary, uh, geology has played a, a large role in both the physical and chemical properties of sediments in the Red River Basin. We have the glacial processes have formed both low permeable sediments as well as high permeable sediments. And then some of these sediments, you know, derived particularly from shale bedrock units, they have more denitrifying potential than sediments derived from crystalline bedrock units in general. But there may be some other chemical properties that are interesting. Maybe there are, there's more organic carbon in the soils and securely in the sediments derived from shale. Maybe there's more potassium. Um, but I want to also point out that in the unsaturated zone where soil scientists typically work, these electron donors aren't going to cause a lot of denitrification because those electron donors will have been weathered over the last several thousand years. It's below the water table where oxygen concentrations are limiting that you will have the denitrif denitrification that we see like for instance in the Elk Valley Aquifer. <clears throat> that's, that's it for me. Great, thank you, Scott. And uh, we'll hold questions until the end. And John, uh, welcome. I know you have a lot of slides, so we're gonna try to get you going as quickly as possible to leave time for questions. So thanks for joining us. John Brecker with Eggvise Laboratories. And again, I'm not gonna read his, uh, his bio there. I'll let you skim that for yourselves. And, um, but before, I also wanna give a shout out to North Dakota Department of Department of Health and Mike L and the Red River Basin Commission for their leadership um, on putting this workshop together, uh, including these pre-workshop webinars. And again, uh, for folks that have any questions for the presenters, please go ahead and put those in the chat box, which should be on the right-hand side of your screen, and we will get to those uh, after John is done. So uh, thanks, John, and go ahead. Already, thank you, Rebecca. Um, so Scott did a fantastic job framing up a lot of the things that I will cover. So I just want to dive into some of these soils and nutrient characteristics. Um, Scott spent some time talking about nitrate. I'm going to talk a little bit about nitrogen and phosphorus because those are the two things that we're generally most concerned about. So while Scott talked about everything probably below one or two meters of the um, Earth's surface, I'm going to focus on that upper one or two meters. Okay. All right, so um, I just want to introduce um, kind of some of the data that I'm going to work for or talk about. And so Eggvice Laboratories, some of you may not be familiar with us, but we are the premier soil testing laboratory in this region. And we have two facilities, one in Northwood, North Dakota, and another one in Benson, Minnesota. And from these two locations, we service um, farmers, crop consultants, agronomists throughout North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan. So, you know, the entirety of the Red River Basin that we are going to be talking about. So that makes us uniquely positioned to share some soil test data on agricultural soil, which, as Scott prefaced, is the dominant land use throughout the Red River Basin. Okay, the, some of the soils within the Red River Basin, the majority of them are mollusols or prairie soils. These are soils that formed under prairie grasses, given our cold climate and extended periods of frozen winters. This has led to soils that 
tend to have very high organic matter. Um, they also have very high nutrient content. And then in the heart of the Red River Basin, um, in the bottom of Glacial Lake Agassiz, there are also some soils that have a high content, high content of shrink swell clays um, that adopt some unique morphology that I'll talk about a little bit. And these are classified as vertisols in that they invert themselves over time. And so they're very similar, um, largely characterized by thick black topsoils. And within the diverse geology that Scott outlined, some of these are well-drained soils. Some of them are very poorly drained soils. Um, some of them are made on sandy sediments on the glacial lake plains or some of the outwash plains that Scott talked about, one of them being the Cheyenne Delta, another very large one being the Otter Tail Outwash area. Um, on the glacial till plains, some of the sediments were loamy or clay glacial tills. So of course the soils that developed on them have soil characteristics of those particular textures. And then in the glacial lake plains, the sediments are usually silty or clay. Okay. Here's a look at the glacial till landscape. You may also hear it referred to as undulating collapsed topography. Um, the collapsed part is related to when the glaciers melted, there are bits of ice that melted away, and so those areas of, the, of that glacial till mantle um, kind of fell down. This landscape often shows erosion scars. You see that on the ridges. A lot of these areas of erosion on top of these ridges is not water erosion. It's mostly tillage erosion as soil is displaced by tillage and it gets moved down the soil surface. And this has happened for, well now, well over a hundred years. So these erosion scars on the top of the soil surface are mostly um, resulting from erosion or tillage erosion. And then of course there are areas around these ridges where water accumulates and flows either to closed basins or it ends up in a water system eventually making its way in this area to Lake Winnipeg. A look at a soil block diagram, again, highlights looking at soils where they fall on the landscape. Some of these soils are on high eroded knob areas, but for the most part, a lot of the water on the landscape moves to these closed depressions on the landscape where the runoff is localized. And these closed depressions usually do not transfer their water to um, a river system unless they are drained, which according to uh, you know, the, the post water bank era um, in the 1980s, um, you can't really drain them if you wanna participate in the farm program or if there is periods of overland flooding, moving water from one closed basin to the next closed basin, which might eventually make itself to a river. This is a look at that glacial till landscape. I assume a lot of us are very familiar with it. This is a look at a wheat stubble field. Again, looking on the left, you'll see one of these mollusols that I mentioned before, very thick black topsoil, highly productive for agricultural production. In the center of the Glacial Lake Basin, there are extensive flat lake plains with very little slope. These are the heart of the Red River Valley soil. An example of one of them, or, or looking at a block diagram, um, compared to the glacial till landscape, there's a lot less relief in this environment than there was in the glacial till plain. Still, there are little areas where there is localized depressions that will collect surface runoff. But since there's not a lot of relief in this environment, some of these closed depressions tend to get very big and cover large acreages. And as a result, a lot of this environment has been surface drained in some capacity over the past 100 years. A look at a particular soil series. This is one of those vertisols that I mentioned before, where I'm going to highlight this vertic feature. 
Um, so since some of these soils undergo this shrink swell action, I've outlined one of these vertic tongues where topsoil has fallen down into cracks and subsoil makes its way upward. So you get this very unusual um, soil profile um, that we call tonguing. And the reason why I, I just want to mention a little bit about this is to provide some context and what this means for modeling water and nutrient movement on the landscape. So on the right, you can see one of these vertic tongues in 2D, but to bring some 3D context to this, you have to imagine it as full, you know, three-dimensional soil. So if you imagine a bulldozer came by and sliced the top of this um, soil profile off on the right, where you have these black tongues down and you have some of these subsoil areas coming up, you get a pattern that you see on the left where you have these vertic tongues as black and then you have these, you know, few square meter polygons of subsoil material. And wherever you have any of these vertic tongues with, um, that, that have fallen down these cracks, these are areas of preferential flow. And although these soil sediments for the most part have low hydraulic conductivity and water moves very slowly through them, so a lot of water tends to run off on the soil surface or if you have tile drainage installed, it moves very slow, but these vertic cracks provide conduits for preferential flow that we cannot ignore, especially if we're trying to model water movement on the landscape. One too far. Okay. In addition to these areas, we do have a few forest and grass covered river valleys. Um, this is a picture of the Cheyenne River Valley near Fort Ransom, North Dakota. Unlike the generally rolling or flat areas of the glacial lake plains or till plains, these river valleys tend to have a fair amount of topography and are areas of the steepest topography that we generally find within the basin. Often they're underlain by coarse textured materials, not always, um, but they are most frequently in rangeland. Some of that rangeland might be forested and grazed. Other um, examples might be pasture and grazed. For the most part, these sloping areas are not used in crop production. And so as Scott noted before, most of the land use in the Red River Basin is involved in dry land crop production nearly 75% of the acres, which encompasses a very diverse range of crops um, from spring wheat, barley, there's corn, soybeans, oats, you guys can see the whole list there. There are a lot of different crops that we grow up here. So some of these BMP strategies um, are not easy to tailor because some of these crop production systems are very diverse in what needs to be done. Outside of crop production, land is often used in pasture, um, CRP, or Conservation Reserve Program. Um, for my Canadian audience, there are wetland acres, there are woodlands, including both riparian woodlands and also shelter belts, which we cannot ignore. And I would be remiss if I did not mention the forest lands, native forests that you can find in Northwest Minnesota and Eastern Manitoba. The predominant soil resource concerns that most land managers have surround, or involve erosion, flooding, which right now as we are going through our spring snowmelt period right now is quite prevalent, and also soil salinity. And soil salinity for many crop producers is the number one land use concern that many have. Um, soil salinity greatly impacts crop production. It, it, well, in, in, in a white expanse like this in the photo, nothing will grow. And in North Dakota, it's an estimated 20% of cropland is affected by soil salinity. Similar numbers in Manitoba. And as Scott outlined, um, Minnesota really doesn't have some of these problems because of the underlying bedrock. The reason why North Dakota and Manitoba tend to have more soil salinity issues is because the bedrock is underlain by marine shales that naturally contain salts. And so under the past 20 year wet cycle, many of those salts have been mobilized from the groundwater, or at least the shallow groundwater. <clears throat> 
And out of these concerns, tile drainage has become a common tool to manage both excess soil water and also soil salinity. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about tile drainage because I want to focus on the soil nutrient characteristics next. Okay, soil nitrate in agricultural fields. I want to give you some context of what are typical values and some of the things that affect um, crop production and why in some cases we might have high nitrate following um, particular crops. Um, so I'm going to give you the example of wheat this past year in 2018 and this is the median nitrate concentration in each of these zip code areas across the uh, um, region and this is in the top two feet. So you can see in the area that is dominantly the Red River Basin, both in North Dakota, Minnesota, and Manitoba, for the most part, soil nitrate values this past year were in the 30 to 40 pound range. This is a good range for most crop production, especially for wheat, because um, we had enough nitrogen to produce a uh, good yield, also to have good protein, but it's not an excessive amount of nitrogen um, being um, or, or hanging around at risk for um, leaching risk. Um, you can see some areas in Manitoba as well as in western North Dakota and South Dakota had much higher nitrate um, levels after wheat and this is because there was extensive drought in these areas and whenever there's a drought you have less crop production, less plant uptake of nitrogen, so as a result the soil test nitrate levels are higher. Looking at the residual nitrate trends historically that we have going back to 1986. This is the median nitrate concentration across the region and I want to draw your attention to drought years and particularly in the late 1980s there were very high amounts of nitrate left in the soil profile because the droughts were so severe in the late 80s and 88 was bad, 89 was bad and it took us a little bit of time, but we finally figured out that we could utilize that residual nitrate. And so we didn't put on as much in the subsequent years and we were able to pull those nitrate levels down to a more manageable level. Then 92 and 93 came around when the wet cycle started and then that kind of took care of a lot of the excess nitrate hanging around. But we can still see years where we had droughts like in 2002, 2006. 2012 and also in 2017 where whenever we have droughts we tend to see higher amounts of residual nitrate. But also make a note that in the subsequent year it usually comes back down. And the reason this happens is because the way we construct fertilizer nitrogen recommendations in this area is we factor in whatever the crop may require, um, any previous crop nitrogen credits, say a, a soybean um, credit for a legume that will provide nitrogen to its next crop, and also that soil test nitrogen. So unlike the U.S. Corn Belt, which does not traditionally sample for nitrate, we test nitrate after crop fields each fall. This serves both as a report card on our fertilizer nitrogen management and it also gets factored into next year's fertilizer nitrogen rate. So just by the standard practice of testing for nitrate every year, we have a built-in feedback me mechanism for excess nitrogen or drought years that tend to leave more nitrate in the environment um, and we can correct that the next year and hopefully we don't have such high leaching conditions that we lose a lot of it until then. Okay changing gear to soil test phosphorus in agricultural fields I want to um, first share a slide that was given to me by Don Flayton at the University of Manitoba um, where soil test phosphorus is in fact linked with soluble phosphorus concentrations in runoff. And so this is work out of Manitoba. And before we start looking at some of the actual soil test levels in the region, um, I want to highlight that the most common soil test values that we run into are way down here on the low side, usually less than 25 parts per million. So looking at the number of soil samples that we receive that have soil test phosphorus levels below 15 parts per million, this graph summarizes it. And the reason why 
15 parts per million is the cutoff I used in this summary, is that that is the critical level for most crops grown in this region. So if a producer has a soil that is below 15 parts per million, it's recommended that phosphorus is applied for him to maximize his crop production or his or her crop production. Now the thing I hope you realize is that throughout most of North Dakota, Northwest Minnesota, that over three quarters to, in some cases, almost 90% of soil samples are below that 15 part per million critical level. This might be a surprise to some of you as we're talking about nutrient loss in the environment, but it stands that most soils do not have enough phosphorus currently. In Manitoba, it's a little bit different. Um, we'll talk about some of those on the next slide, but throughout most of this region and throughout most of the Red River Basin, our soils do in fact need more phosphorus, at least from a crop production standpoint. Okay, changing that threshold to now show soil test levels that are above 60 parts per million, which I think um, many of us could agree is probably an environmentally risky soil test phosphorus. At the very least, it's well above the agronomic optimum. But the reason why I pick 60 parts per million is in current Manitoba regulations, they begin regulating phosphorus or manure application when phosphorus levels are above 60 parts per million. And the only area where we see a high density of samples with soil test values above 60 parts per million is in South Manitoba. This would be the ROA postal code um, southeast of Winnipeg. And the reason why we tend to see a lot more high phosphorus levels here is because this is one of the few areas where there is a high concentration of animal production, in this case swine production, and there is um, a lot of that gets applied there. Um, if we keep moving that needle and we are now looking at the number of soils that are above 180 parts per million, at which point Manitoba regulations prohibit any phosphorus application, there is only one postal code area and that is in the ROE postal code area east of Winnipeg and that is only 1% of soil samples. Now I want to qualify this, in the ROE area a lot of this is in forest and so there's not a lot of soil samples or crop fields in this region that we actually get samples for. So backtracking a little bit, um, I do want to highlight that the majority of Northern Plain soils are deficient for crop production. So the, the kind of takeaway from this slide is most crops actually need more fertilizer than they're currently receiving. So how do we make sure that we do this in the right fashion? Um, one way is knowing that broadcast phosphorus is kind of a risky strategy, particularly in regard to runoff phosphorus loss. This uh, data is from a proof of concept paper out of Ohio. And on the right, you see monoammonium phosphate that was broadcast on the soil surface. If we compare that same rate that was then banded only one centimeter below the soil surface, so it's no longer on the surface and vulnerable to runoff. We've greatly decreased the amount of runoff phosphorus, which is on par with the unfertilized soil. So just by improving our placement, which is agronomically more efficient and it's less environmentally risky, I think we can come a long way. I do want to come back to some of the high soil test levels because these areas do exist. Um, if we think about that one E part per million cutoff before, um, this is some runoff and soil test phosphorus work that came out of Alberta, looking at total soil test phosphorus, not um, soluble or, or uh, dissolved phosphorus runoff, but total phosphorus runoff. If you do have high testing soils um, above 100, especially near 200, we are gonna run into higher amounts of phosphorus in our runoff. But most of our typical soils in the Canadian prairies as well as in the northern Great Plains of the United States are way down here on the low end. So let's drill down into this cluster of dots and looking at typical soil test values for cultivated cropland, there isn't much of a relationship between soil test phosphorus given normal agronomic ranges and the amount of phosphorus in runoff. Over here, there's a few dots on the far left. That is from native rangeland. 
much lower soil test phosphorus, but still the phosphorus concentration in the runoff is on the same magnitude as cultivated cropland. Here I want to highlight two additional dots, and this is um, some, some work that Don Flayton shared with me. I really appreciate uh, his help with this. Um, again, here we have some more dots of native rangeland that comes from Ortonville, Minnesota, so in the Minnesota River Valley, where 80% of this runoff occurred in snowmelt. So this is kind of the background, um, natural background that is in some cases on the same order as cultivated cropland for phosphorus runoff concerns. Um, in my remaining time, I do want to talk about the non-cropland land use, which is about 25% of the remaining land. And the reason that these lands are not utilized for crop production is mostly because they're unfit for use as crop production. They might have steep to far topography that has a high runoff risk. They may be near or along water rate ways, so there is a high loading risk of nutrients into that waterway. Some of these soils are coarse textured gravelly soils with high leaching risks. Other ones might be poorly drained wetland soils, and in this case often they have localized drainage basins. So again, these are the soils that are used for pasture, CRP, wetlands, woodlands, and forest lands. And I want to recognize that these soils are different because they require different BMP strategies because a lot of them have high nutrient loss risks associated with their environment, um, but they're not the soils that are really receiving lots of fertilizer. They generally have low nutrient inputs. So with that in mind, um, we have to think about these in a different way. And I do want to just make one mention about pasture lands, and, and this comes from my experience living in New Zealand for a little while. In New Zealand, there's a lot of rangeland, or I shouldn't say rangeland, it's, it's highly um, pasture, but for their case, they have a lot of concern about nitrate leaching um, underneath livestock production where urine patches have very high nitrogen loading rates, you know, in a very confined area, but there's no way that a plant can actually utilize all that nitrogen, so it ends up leaching away under this isolated hotspot. And I think that is one of the things that we are um, neglecting in research in this part of the world, but is one thing I, I think would be good to talk about um, at the workshop in two weeks. Um, one last note on these non-cropland areas. If you ever have plant residues that are green and frozen going into winter and they encounter snowmelt, if they're green, they are liable to release large amounts of dissolved phosphorus. This is some work from Canada um, examining different plant residues. Um, I, I, I will highlight the plant residues on the right first, looking at flax, wheat, and lentils as the annual crop lands, and then contrast that with you know fresh forages that may be um, frozen and then um, subjected to snowmelt runoff. Also winter wheat cover crops are probably somewhere between new forage and winter wheat. Cover crops, if you freeze them and they are prone to snowmelt runoff, um, can be other sources of dissolved phosphorus release where in some cases we might be trying to use those as a best management practice in themselves. We should also recognize that riparian grasslands are prone to more dissolved phosphorus loss than many other crop lands that we um, run into. So in summary, um, I guess I will leave it at that and based on time, I think let's move into questions. Great, thank you, uh, John. And uh, we did have one question that, I, that uh, Lonnie asked that Scott answered in the chat box. So we go ahead and take a look at that. Um, other questions from uh, our participants? We haven't had many coming in in the chat box, so um, feel free in our remaining six minutes to ask those questions. And while, while we're waiting, I guess I'll ask John, um, in the first, you may have already answered this with some subsequent slides, but your first phosphorus runoff slide when you were talking about incorporating um, nutrients. Did that slide 
also take into account dissolved phosphorus or is that just particulate um, phosphorus? So I believe they, um, looking at, um, asking you, it's going to take some while to find it, but the one looking at the King paper, I believe, I'm going to have to double check on that, um, they reported it as molybdate reactive phosphorus, so that would be dissolved reactive phosphorus, so not total phosphorus. So this one is dissolved here? Yep, actually I'm at my computer, I'm going to pull it up before I have to correct myself. <laughs> so somebody else got to answer, ask, can ask a question. Okay. Well, while you, I'm just, I'm just looking for those questions, and since uh, I'm going to ask another one while we're waiting, um, and as a Wisconsinite, you know, not, not in the uh, northern Great Plains, um, you talked about native um, rangeland, and uh, for us uneducated folks from the east, does that mean there are, there is livestock uh, on that land, or is, is that like not, you know? Um, uh, perennial, uh, perennial landscape without livestock. Best way to answer that question is yes. Um, so the cases where there wouldn't be livestock would mostly be CRP um, land that is still in conservation reserve program. Most of that has been taken out of conservation reserve program, especially since 2007, but there is still considerable amounts of rangeland and pasture land that is grazed by cattle. Few sheep, but for the most part, it is um, cattle, yeah. Perfect, thank you. Okay, we're trying to, trying to give people uh, um, some opportunity to ask uh, questions here. Uh, we're not seeing any more forthcoming, so I'm gonna keep forwarding here um, and, and thank our presenters very much for lots of uh, concentrated information and great, great maps. Uh, sorry for that first one not showing up there, Scott. Um, and uh, again, this presentation will be available uh, online so you can access it later uh, before, the, uh, before the workshop. Please do that and go ahead and review. Uh, also, we have, you know, Scott's and John's emails here, and I, th I don't think they would mind if you thought of some additional questions um, before the workshop. You can go ahead and, and contact them uh, at these uh, email addresses. And again, we have one more pre-workshop webinar on Friday, April 12th from 10 to 11 a.m. Central Time. This one will be on Red River Basin hydrology, runoff characteristics, and nutrient trends. And again, we're trying to get some foundational information out for you so when we come into the workshop, we can uh, go right on to haggling over some of these tougher issues and, and uh, seeking a common understanding from a diverse range of experiences across the basin. Um, our speakers uh, for this next webinar will be Henry Van Offelen, uh, Rochelle Neustad, and Henry Wilson. And again, the I put a link in the chat box. You can uh, see that if you go back up to the site for registration. And here is the um, here again is that uh, URL for workshop registration and other information and draft agenda and all that. So uh, we really appreciate you joining us. And uh, I was seeing Mike L typing, so I just wanted to check in, make sure he had no additional, uh, nothing additional to say. Giving us one more minute here. And I don't know, Janice, if you can turn on Mike's microphone, uh, if he's not able, if we're not able to hear him, if that might be easier. Um, Rebecca, that was soluble phosphorus. It was, great, thank you, wow. Um, thanks for uh, getting that in right under the wire. And Mike says, just wanted to say thanks uh, to the speakers and uh, and also thanks to all of you participating. And we, we hope to see you in Crookston um, in a couple weeks. Thank you everyone and 